Morning. Good morning, dearly beloved. So great to see you. My name is Michael. I'm the pastor. I'm your pastor here at Christ by the Sea United Methodist. So thrilled for us to be together. I want to extend a special word of welcome to anybody who might be joining us for the first time. I want to not just say, uh, I'm so glad that you're here, but I want to say, we're so glad that you're here. Thank you for being willing to share your beautiful Sunday morning with us. Thank you for having the courage to go to a new place, and I hope that you are already making friends. Uh, I would love to get a chance to get to meet you following worship, if you would be willing to, uh, to approach me. Tell me that the pastor said you had to do this, that you, you're not comfortable with it, but you feel like you've got to, and then I'll take it from there. But I would love to just get to welcome you in person. I also want to say hi to those of you who might be uh, returning back from a summer up north. Welcome home to you. Uh, we're all so glad to see you as well. And if you're just coming back from up north, I would love a chance to get to also greet you personally. So uh, do the same deal where you say, well, the pastor said I'd come see you. And I'll say, welcome home and, uh, and give you a hug. And that'll be fantastic. I also want to say hi to those who are worshiping online. Uh, welcome to you. We're grateful for you wherever and whenever you are worshiping with us. Uh, last week, we had a power surge hit the church property uh, before Sunday, and it knocked off our live streaming capabilities. Uh, but we, I believe we are back live this morning. So you can always, uh, if, we're, if you're not able to join us live or we have a technical issue, we always upload worship. And so you can access it on our YouTube channel, uh, usually by noon or 1 p.m. on that day. But in any event, so glad that you are uh, joining with us today. We pray that uh, there is blessing in your life. There's a few announcements I want to just point your attention toward on the back of the bulletin. Uh, the first is that we have uh, our church or charge conference, as you may know the language. Uh, it's our yearly meeting of the church to, to just vote on a couple of business items. There's not going to be any real surprises in it this year. Most years there are not. Uh, but we are doing that in tandem with, I think it's 11 other United Methodist churches. We meet today at First United Methodist Port St. Lucie at 3 p.m. It's about a 45 minute drive from here. So if you wanna drive an hour and a half round trip for a fun vote on a couple items, come join us <laughs> and celebrate together. Misery loves company. I would love to have you there. It won't be misery, it'll be okay, probably. Don't tell the district superintendent I said that. All right, uh, Wednesday noon Bible study is underway. We had our kickoff session uh, just a few days ago. Uh, around 30 plus people came in person. We had another six join us online. Uh, we still have room for more. If you missed last week, but you're, you're intrigued, you're interested, you'd like to study some of the Bible, you don't have to worry about having missed a session. Uh, it's gonna be a long Bible study. It's gonna go all the way until Holy Week of next spring. So you might miss a couple of sessions. You're welcome to join in wherever you're able. And uh, it's a real cheer cheerful spirit among the folks. We have a great time. Bring a lunch with you. We'll provide drink and dessert. That's uh, Wednesday at noon, either in person or online. Our participation in the Soup Bowl continues. Uh, it, that's a community effort here in Vero Beach to aid hunger. And so we are inviting you to bring cans of chicken noodle and tomato soup. I know many of you have already done that uh, this morning. Thank you for that. And uh, if you want to know more information about not only the collection, but the actual kind of soup bowl event that happens in a way that you can buy a bowl and have soup and have it go toward a great cause, be sure to read your monthly newsletter, The Soundings. There's information about it in there. I also want to share with you that Band of Brothers is back on. We're back. Uh, that Band of Brothers is our men's group here at Christ by the Sea. And uh, this group of men love to get together and eat breakfast and I'll be honest with you, jab each other a bit. You never met a friendlier bunch of insults than by the Band of Brothers. Uh, but in all seriousness, great guys. They, and we love, if you've never been part and you're interested, please join us on uh, Saturday, October 21st at Ratcliffe Hall. We're gonna, that's going to be our initial meeting of the season. We're going to talk a bit more about what we're going to do in the future. We're going to have uh, some delicious pastries and, and coffee Saturday, October 21st. Uh, next Saturday or next Sunday, we are receiving new members into the life of the church. We held a new member orientation, but there may there may be some of you who were not able to join us uh, for that. If you are interested, would love for you to come and to be part of our uh, new member reception next Sunday. Just contact me if you're interested, 
in becoming a member. I also want to lift up to you. Was the choir supposed to sing on the way in? Did I cut it off? Okay. Oof. Man, I had a little heart attack. It's the first Sunday for the choir returning for this season, everybody. Hooray! Welcome back, choir. Um, we are on Friday, October 20th. We are celebrating the life of Kemp Moore, a member of this church, uh, dearly beloved and friend of mine. And uh, we're going to celebrate his life. And then we are going to have a reception afterward, a lunch reception, that will be in Kemp's, uh, in Kemp's flavor as we have a Texas barbecue full spread of wonderfulness that his family is providing. So in order, to, though, to accurately get enough food to feed all of uh, you hungry folks, we're just asking if you know that you're coming and you're going to stay for the reception, that you would sign up in the lobby. We have a, you can see a little sign on our um, desk and it says, please sign up here for the reception for Kemp Moore's uh, Celebration of Life. Please uh, let us know that you're coming. Well, that's all the announcements I have. Now I'm going to turn it over to our staff parish chairperson, camera operator, baker of all things, and all around wonderful person, Joe Parrish. Gee, good morning, church family. You know, October, many of you know, is pastor appreciation time. It's a month that's set aside for us to honor and to appreciate, show our appreciation for our pastor. So we have chosen today as a special day to celebrate in Ratcliffe Hall after a short sermon, I think, a short <laughs> sermon. The invitation is extended to everyone, whether you be, this is your first day at Christ by the Sea, whether you're a um, visitor, longtime visitor, a new member, an old member. If you're breathing, come to Radcliffe Hall and help us celebrate this wonderful gift that God has given us, our pastor. Our pastor is indeed loved and appreciated. So please come. You, you will add joy just by your presence. So please join us. There's one correction that I want to make in the bulletin or on the screen. Uh, the ladies, the women's luncheon is going to be Thursday. You can write this down. It's Thursday the 19th at River Twist, and there will be a sign-up sheet after the service today for you to sign up. So whether, you, I don't know what you've seen on the screen, I don't know what's on the bulletin, but I was told by an authority that uh, I would ask if I would please announce that. So I'm gonna see you in Radcliffe Hall, and we're gonna all celebrate this wonderful gift that God has given us. See you there. <laughs> Well, what a coincidence, because I'll be celebrating you. We'll be celebrating each other, and uh, really I'm looking forward to it being a celebration of Christ by the Sea, uh, United Methodist Church, and I'm so thankful for the role that I get to be uh, in it and part of your lives. Well, let's take a few moments now to center ourselves in a moment of prayer. Lord God, thank you for the gift of being together in love today. Lord, uh, we've come together to honor you, to praise you, to offer gifts to you. And as you do, you return love back to us. We thank you for that. We ask that you would fill us with your joy and peace today, that you would mark us as people who patiently wait on you as we walk in kindness and goodness. Lord, may we be faithful and generous as you remain faithful and generous to us. Strengthen our self-control as we walk in the way that leads to both life abundant and life eternal. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you now to stand in body or spirit as we sing together our opening song, Holy Ground, and you can find those words on the screen.
Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. A word of encouragement came from the prophet to the people. Live a life, life that is full, build, plan, e, love, multiply. Pray for your communities. Keep, Keep God, God in the center of, of all that it is. We enter into worship today with hope in our hearts for, for something that have here that reminds us that we can live as God desires. God has made a promise of faithfulness to us. And we can be judged in lives. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on page 881 in your hymnal. I believe God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He smooth day, he rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall jump to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life of the lasting. Amen. You may be seated. The ushers have come forward for our offertory. Lord, we are thankful for so many things. You have given us so many blessings, and we need to return some of that to you. 
Abundant God, may our giving today play a part in the nourishing of your world and the nurturing of your children. Let these gifts give rest to those who are weary, provide substance to those who are hungry, and bring healing where there is pain. In the Lord's name we ask this. Amen. Be seated once more. It's not listed in the bulletin, but we do want to take a few moments, especially today, to have a time of uh, pastoral prayer. Uh, we are mindful this morning of the conflict in Israel and Palestine. Uh, it's on so many hearts, not just in this congregation, but around the world today. We're mindful and acknowledge the hundreds of deaths that have occurred just this weekend, the thousands of injuries, the grief, the anger the fear, the sadness, running deep with people. So we're going to spend a few moments praying for the seemingly impossible, uh, that it might become a reality, that there might be peace, that whatever part we can play in peacemaking, that we avail ourselves to the Lord and to the world to do it. Uh, I received an email this morning from a friend of mine uh, Rabbi Michael Bernholz, who presides at Temple Beth Shalom here in Vero Beach, and his email contained a word and an invitation I want to share with you. 
Uh, he writes, as of today, there is te terrible violence in the Middle East in the midst of the Jewish high holy days that affects the international community as well as people of many faiths. While there can be much discussion as to the causes and sources of this conflict, there can be no question that this violence does not lead to any form of peace and it serves no one any good, and it just puts more people in harm's way. There are innocent people on all sides of this conflict. Temple Beth Shalom will be hosting a vigil of peace and care this coming Monday, October 9th at 6 p.m. This vigil for, will be for the congregation and the community at large. So again, uh, if you wish to come together in prayer with folks in the community, uh, I'll be there tomorrow night at Temple Beth Shalom. It's maybe a 10-minute drive from here, and uh, we will come together at 6 o'clock to spend some time asking again for God to do what seems to be impossible. But we know with God all things are possible, that there would be peace. So we pray in that way this morning, and then after my words of prayer, I'll invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we unite with all those who come together in prayer today, all who come together in a spirit of peace to acknowledge the terrible losses that have been suffered over this weekend and how they are connected to so many other losses for centuries. And Lord, we see through it all, violence begets violence begets violence. And heard through all that violence is the cry of the most vulnerable citizens who suffer the worst losses. And the cry that comes forward, Lord, that we echo is, how long? How long, O oh Lord? As Jesus calmed the stormy sea, may there be a stilling of the winds of war in that region. May there be a divine movement within human hearts that it would be so. For us here, Halfway around the world, we can feel so far from it all and so powerless, and yet there is a restlessness and a dis-ease as we bear witness to what is taking place. Lord, we ask that you would take our fear and grief, our anger and sadness, and that you would turn them into something productive, that you would allow us to draw together, that you would allow us, that you would empower us to take each encounter we have as an opportunity to sow kindness, not hate, to sow peace, not war, in our community and in the world. Lord, we do ask that you would be most present with those who need you most desperately on this day. We pray this in faith and trust that you are the one who is working in all things to bring about good for those who trust you and follow you, those who love you. Now, as Jesus taught us to pray, we say together with one voice and heart, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, before my very brief sermon, I have two special guests who I've asked to share a word with you. Hi, everybody. Some of you might know me, some of you might not. My name is Jordan Pestel, and I moved here a year ago. I love this church because everybody here is so warming and welcoming, and I love the pastor, who's my dad. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, I have two notes for you, my dad. Right, <laughs> um, one, stop embarrassing me sometimes. <laughs> and two, your sermons are just too long sometimes. <laughs> uh, the congregation and I... Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness, my daughter. Okay, so she's a truth teller, like I am, and that is mixed with her dad's comedic timing. That uh, would be a dangerous combination going forward. My name is Katie. It is so wonderful to be able to just say a few words to you all this morning. 
Um, I want to let you know, first off, that Michael and Jordan, they are the absolute loves of my life. And um, I am very, very um, intentional about whom I entrust the loves of my life to. And so I want to say to you all this morning that I entrust them to you. I entrust my family to you. And um, <laughs> thank you for the ways over the past year and, and several months, the ways in which that you have welcomed us into the church, um, especially on those Sundays when Jordan and I sneak in late. Of course, we, we rarely make it on time, but we sneak into the back and we sit amongst you um, back row crews and we thank you for welcoming us when we are back there with you. Um, thank you for the ways in which you have reached out, the ways in which you have encouraged us through uh, gracious gifts and invitations. Too many invitations that we could ever in a lifetime say yes and accept. We, we appreciate each and every one of those. Um, and we give thanks to you. Thank you for being Christ by the Sea United Methodist Church, a place of welcome, a place of love, a place of inclusion for all. Thank you for including us in your church's story. We very much feel a part, and we look forward to years to come. Thank you all. We look forward to celebrating with you. Have a great morning. later today, Jordan. <laughs> well, uh, we do have a sermon, and, uh, and I'm going to keep it tight today. So uh, we, we are in this series uh, that uh, you'll understand a little bit more today why I named it Turning the Gem. It's really a series about understanding the Bible a bit better, the nature of the Bible, and, and how it is we look at it. And last week, we started with this idea that the Bible is this collection of works that had their origination in this. Someone wrote something down that the Holy Spirit nudged in different people and different authors and times, and, and together, these collection of writings formed for us what is our Holy Scriptures, which we understand to be our standard rule of faith and of practice. It's, it's where we find the, the great story of God and how God's been moving and working in the world and what it is God is calling for us to experience and to do. So for the, uh, the sermon today, Turning the Gem, it comes from this ancient rabbinic tradition that the, the teachers of the scriptures before Jesus and, and maybe even Jesus himself used this imagery they would say the scripture is like a sacred gem, and it's a gem with 70 sides to it. And, and our work in reading the scriptures is to keep turning that gem and looking into the different facets of what a scripture might speak to us, and then see the divine miracle of how it is God gives us something new each time. How it is that we look through the gem of scripture and see through a facet of it and come to a realization. That's what we call in its most basic form an interpretation. Now, it doesn't mean every interpretation is correct. We're going to talk about that more in two weeks as we talk about Jesus uh, coming to earth as God and then Jesus' interaction with Scripture. Uh, so we'll talk about affirming the Scriptures and denying them. But we do believe that the, the scriptures are alive, and depending where we are in our life journey, the experiences we've had, the ways that we've been shaped, for better or for worse, all of those things kind of impact how it is we read the scriptures through the facet that we are looking at them by. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The first example I want to offer is this phrase, God is love. It's explicitly said in 1 John chapter 4. It is uh, indirectly said and it is shown in a whole pantheon of other passages, essentially linking that the primary characteristic of God, the very nature of God, is love. God is love. So, you know, simple enough until you, you know, ask the pesky question, well, what is love exactly? And what does it mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? And... 
where I'm at right now, I probably have a different understanding of love today than I did 10 years ago. But the, our view of love at 7 and 17 and 70 can all have profound differences, right? You know, our, our shaping of our understanding of love very first in our uh, life comes to us from our parents. Our parents are our first image of both who God is and what love is. And depending upon the, the way in which our parents carried out that role, we might, we might have a very healthy and sort of in line with the, the biblical witness view of love. And we, in other cases, we might have a view of love that is a bit different than that. So all of that stuff kind of factors into when we say God is love, how to me that can mean one thing and to you that can mean perhaps something radically different. And perhaps there's truth in both perspectives or maybe there's a perspective that's skewed or, or not, but, but, but the work of interpretation and chewing on the scriptures and integrating them sort of into our life and with each other, it's how we come to arrive at a better reading of the scriptures and ultimately understanding of the truth that God has for us and for the world. How about this example? Uh, from the Big Ten, we have in there listed, you shall not covet. And, you know, of course, we're Bible-believing people, and we, uh, yes, amen, you shall not covet. But what does covet mean exactly? Because I live in a society where the whole economic structure is based on coveting. Every aspect of life that is advertised to me is, don't you wish that you had this? So God, when you tell me not to covet, do you mean everything? Because I really like some of that stuff. Some of that stuff I don't have but want really badly. And we're reminded as we read in those Ten Commandments that the coveting isn't just about stuff, but it's about people. It's about relationships as well. And so uh, how does it work that there is something in us that, that I think we view appropriately as a positive a drive within us to have a goal for, for something or a, a goal for a relationship with someone and to move toward having that goal achieved, how do we align that then with one of the Big Ten Commandments saying, don't do that? Well, maybe what it's talking about is, is something nuanced, and, but, it, but in order to figure that out, it requires turning the gem. It requires deeper uh, again, chewing on the text and looking beyond the text and figuring out where it is God is leading us. Uh, we could have a whole sermon series about just the Big Ten with that. We have in there no idols. We have no murder. We have honor your father and mother. We have remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. All of those could have really really not great sort of illuminating for us based on certain interpretations of how we are following those well or not following them, but we need to understand what they are and what they're conveying. So I say all that to say it's complicated. I went to a church once that had registration pads like ours, and on there it asked if you were a first-time visitor, if right there on the pad, would you give us a little info about yourself? And uh, it had those boxes to check about relationship status. And it had single, it had married, and then it had a third one that I had not seen before and haven't seen since on a registration pad. It said, uh, a third option for, to single, married, or it's complicated. <laughs> and I remember seeing that when I was in my early 20s, and I'm like, it's not complicated. You're either single or you're married. And now I've lived a little longer. And I've been around some people, and while I am married, it's not complicated for me, I have been around and made friends with enough folks to know sometimes it's not as clean cut and simple as, well, we've been committed to each other for 25 years, and we share the same home and our same finances, and we share life together, but, but we both got burned in our first marriage, and we're scared to walk down the aisle again. I, there's all sorts of complications. So, so when we're talking about reading the scriptures, if relationship status can be complicated, so can the Bible. And if I can be okay with relationship status being complicated, I can also be okay with the Bible being complicated. And again, searching for nuance and digging deeper and trying to get more to the heart 
of what it is, the reality is that God has for us. So I want to key in this morning with just my few minutes remaining on, uh, as we're talking about turning the gem, I want to look at our flood story in our biblical narrative in, in Genesis chapter 6, very early in the Bible. And I want to particularly, I'm going to look at the very beginning before the raindrops start falling and what, what leads to it. And then I'm going to look at the very end as the raindrops are ceasing. So Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, <clears throat> we have this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings that I've created. Oh, it's a real joyful text this morning, right? You follow? I mean, this is awful. God has just, we're only a few chapters into human history, and God has said, oh my me, this is a nightmare. Did you catch, that's a little joke grenade. Oh my me, God said. Oh my me. Yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> The things you got to do when you're reading really difficult passages, like God saying, every thought of human beings is wicked, and I'm going to smite them all. But it grieved God to God's heart. So then verse 7, so the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. In the Hebrew, that word, I am sorry, is also the same word for repent. I regret. <laughs> Oh, my me, I am sorry, me. I repent of my sin of making human beings that didn't go like I planned. Verse 8, but Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. And that but changes the entire narrative. So uh, here, I'm going to pause here. We're going to rejoin the story. But first, I want to lift up. This is, I thought this was an appropriate scripture for us in this sermon because it's an application of how we turn the gem of scripture but at the same time in this story, God is doing something of a gem turning on God's own self, on God's view of what a situation is, and God really kind of turning us as well. We see it, God saying, I'm sorry that I made you. I'm going to wipe all you out. Click, click, click. Well, there is Noah. Maybe I can rethink this. So, uh, the flood narrative in our, in our scripture is one of dozens of sacred text flood narratives that were developed in ancient history. Dozens of religions, dozens of peoples came up with a story that has a lot of similarities to this one. Not just that there's a flood, but in that flood, there's a description of God regretting creating people in this world. And God's saying, I'm going to flood you all out. I've had it with you. It's time for a restart. Uh, we have these, these uh, stories developed in Europe, in Asia, in South America. And of particular note to me as I looked this up was in North America, in our Native American tribes, thousands and thousands of years ago, we have histories of dozens of these, of nearly two dozen of these American, North American tribes creating their own version of God looked at humanity, God didn't like what God saw, and God decided to flood us all out of existence. There are two key differences that our Genesis story has with any of these other flood narratives that developed in the ancient world. The first one is this. It's the, but God saw Noah. But Noah pleased the Lord. Our story that we are grafted into is one that as people were trying to cope, it seems worldwide that there had been some kind of massive flood event and all kinds of religious people are saying, Lord, what is going on? That it is in our lineage of faith that we see you know, God's displeased, which we, we still carry some of that theology with us today, but especially in the ancient world, 
If you sneezed, they believed it was because God was doing something in you. That's where we get God bless you from. You know, you're exposed for this minute. A demon can enter your nostrils. God bless you, it'll block it. I mean, we, everything imaginable was attributed to God's hand. And all people around the world are struggling. God, why are you doing this to us? And they're praying and they're seeking. And in their spirits, they're hearing, I'm doing this because I'm angry at you. But it's in our story that they're hearing, yeah, God's not happy. But God is still looking for the best among us. God is still looking to see what is redeemable within us. God sees one and has mercy. God gives a second chance. Ultimately, as we are living proof, we see that God says, I'm not ready to be done with you just yet. So now I want to turn to after the raindrops have fallen to Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. It's a few verses. Hang in there with me. I want to, I want to ask you to pay attention to four particular things that come up over and over and over and over in this, uh, in this part of the story. What comes up over and over again is about flood and people and rainbows and covenant. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you. Covenant is like a relational promise. It's a relational trust. It's a relational agreement. And covenant in in Bible sense almost always means, here's what I agree to do for you. And and I expect you to keep your end of the bargain of what you will do for me, that we'll be in this together. So as for me, God says, I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I will establish, or I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant, of the agreement that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, my rainbow, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, so when you see those those dark clouds forming and you think, oh no, here comes the flood again, look in the clouds for the rainbow. Verse 15, I will remember my covenant, my promise, our agreement that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the rainbow is in the clouds, I will see it and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Then God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. We we talked last week for a moment about how precious papyrus space was. There's not wasted words. There's a condensing of words. And so it tells us when we're reading the Bible, when we see something over and over and over again, that it is really important, that it's God's way of saying, hello, McFly, anybody home? Pay attention. Covenant, flesh, rainbow, flood. I am promising you with this rainbow in the sky, and this is where our our looking through the gem, our scriptures reveal to us a God different than the God's lowercase g of the world, is that our God has made a promise that what you experience, I'm not going to allow to happen again. My promise to you is I'm going to keep you. The, The other narratives of flood They don't read that in the end, God goes, oh my goodness, uh, I I brought you out of the flood and I'm going to keep you from being drowned ever again. I'm with you. The other narratives go like this. God floods the world. God looks out over the world or the gods look and they see that some people survived and they go, huh, you've got a little bit in common with cockroaches, don't you? Tough to kill. Nuclear war and floods can't undo you. Well... You got lucky this time, but be careful next time. Essentially, when you see those dark clouds forming again, you better remember who's the boss, and you better worry that I'm going to flood the earth again. But in our story, 
God says, I don't want you to live in that fear. I don't want you to live guided by that anxiety. I want us to be in a relationship together, me for you and you for me. Our view of God is different than the rest. We see the flood story as we turn that gem through the prism of that we are sinners in the hands of a loving God, not sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, a case could be made for both, couldn't it? But our faith tradition is such that we have turned the gem past the angry God, recognizing God was angry, God saw wickedness, God still sees wickedness, but that ultimately God is love, God is grace, God is mercy, God is second chances. God wants this to work. It's not the God of my grandmother who always told me, God is watching you, so you better not do something wrong. Otherwise, God's going to hit you with a shoe. That, that was her method of keeping me in line was the shoe. So God would have the same one. But that's not, that is not the story of our faith. God is angry about things that happen. God does recognize wickedness and want it to end. But God's ultimate posture is that of love. And God has shown through Jesus that wickedness comes to an end not by begetting more wickedness. Boy, I got some emails when I mentioned a few weeks ago about uh, all evil originating from the desire to eliminate evil. People are like, that was a head scratcher, which it is if you chew on that. But Jesus shows us that there is a, there is a pathway to eliminate evil, to, to approach wickedness without more wickedness being the solution, that it doesn't have to be an endless cycle of violence. And death. Our fl- I'm grateful for our flood story. And I think it's powerful to see it in the context of all these other flood stories. That there's, there's kind of a gem just of flood stories in our world with 70 facets. And we click and we read through them, and including ours, and we see the grace of God shining through it. I'm looking forward to the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to take you on more gem-turning adventures Uh, hold on to your belt loops for this one. Next week, we're going to explore what would Jesus do and what would Jesus do kind of with circumcision. (laughs) Jordan, you got to go to kids' church for that one. That one's going to get a little bit um, beyond where where I want you to go. So uh, we're going to talk about what would Jesus do in circumcision. We are going to talk about the notion that Jesus... Uh, was during those years on earth the physical manifestation of God's very presence. We, we call it incarnation, that Jesus was God incarnate. What does it mean that Jesus was God come in human form, and how does that interact? How did Jesus interact with the scriptures? I'm really looking forward to that, this idea of Jesus saying, I've come to fulfill the scriptures, not to abolish them. Then on the final week, mystery week, I'm going to talk about a great city, not a great in the sense of good, but great as far as well-known city in the scriptures, known for its wickedness. And we're going to look at the story of its wickedness, and I think we're going to turn the gem to see that the wickedness of that city is not because of the reason that so many of us have been taught and thought, not just over the course of our lives, but for centuries. And that the very witness of the Bible through the prophet Ezekiel And through Jesus Christ, as they talk about this city, we begin to see why this city is lifted up in the ways of wickedness that it is and what lessons we can take from that for our our world and our life today. So I don't don't know if you could tell, but I'm psyched about it. Uh, To me, the party we're having today would be about turning the gem, not about pastor appreciation, although I'm so honored and thrilled, but I I get more excited about that we are looking through the scriptures together, we're honestly approaching them, and we're beginning to really drill in deeply to see the nuanced truth that God wants to bring to us. And I think it's life-changing. I know it's life-changing. It's been life-changing for me, and I pray it will be for some of you as well. Well, let's pray for a few moments now. Lord God, we give thanks to you. We give thanks for the Bible, for this collection this collection of stories, law, poems, letters, gospel, prophetic utterance. Lord, it's a miracle that we have access to this grand narrative.
God, as we continue to read the Bible, we ask that it would also read us, that it would more so read us, that we wouldn't master it, that we would be mastered by it. Lord, may you guide us as we turn the gem of these scriptures and that we would be shaped by what we see, what we hear, what we feel. God, bless us in the living out of this book of our faith. We ask this by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, you have an insert that was given to you in your bulletin. If you would find that insert, I want to invite you to stand as we sing together now this closing hymn. We're going we're gonna to party, I'm told. So come eat some cake with us. Or it, I'm not sure what there is in terms, but I know it's always fantastic in terms of the things that have been prepared by Joan and the, the kitchen team and the hospitality team. And uh, I truly am looking forward to celebrating us. Uh, God brought us together, I think, when we both really needed each other. I needed Christ by the sea. And you have been... You have been and you continue to be God's blessing in my life, and I pray that God uses me to bless you as well through what we have journeyed through and what it is that is still to come. The future is so bright, I've got to wear shades, so I'm wearing glasses this morning. So I, I am thankful for you, and I am looking forward to us sharing together in our time. Uh, before we do that, I want to offer you these words of closing blessing to our time of worship, though. Would you receive these words of blessing? Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance, God's holy smile, may that be on you and may it give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.